It's Jobs Friday, and you're in the right place because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. And this is David Hansen. It is indeed not only Friday, it's Jobs Friday. Your favorite Friday of the month. You what? love Jobs Friday. I don't love Jobs Friday. Mm -hmm. It's... It's kind of exciting because everybody else gets excited about it. I don't get excited at all. It's it's like when I when I come home from work and I'm excited to be home and that makes my dog excited. Mm. That's kind of the way it is. So you're the dog. I guess I'm the that dog that in that scenario. Yeah. It's about There's worse things to be than dog. Yes. Dog's life is pretty much laying around sleeping all day and then getting excited about something. I could do that. Give my dog a carrot and she gets all happy. If I got that happy from a carrot, my life would be pretty something good. Something would be wrong with you as well. Speaking of speaking of idiots. Uh, have you ever seen the show An Idiot Abroad? I started watching this last night. This is I think a, I've heard of it. It's kind of, it's a Ricky Gervais, it's, he's sort of involved in it, but it's this uh, idiot, I guess it's in the name of the show, mm -hmm. who, goes, who goes to foreign countries. I watched the first two episodes last night. It was uh, China and then India, and it's pretty hilarious. Is it reality or is it like scripted? No, it's reality. Okay. Reality. He goes over there and they basically, Ricky Gervais in setting up the show describes it as an elaborate practical joke and it, it pretty much is that. They put him in some pretty uncomfortable What's the situations. Channel? What's it on? Netflix. Netflix. Okay. Of course. <laughs> All right. Getting to the good stuff. First headline, of course, jobs. Bloomberg, payrolls in U.S. rose 192,000 in March, unemployment 6.7%. Where's our colon? Pretty straightforward headline from Bloomberg. That is a, that is a pretty, that's a pretty They're straightforward slacking. headline. So payrolls were up 192,000. That was, we can call that right in the range of expectations, right? Right in yeah. the range. Uh, this follows on January and February jobs numbers and maybe even December jobs numbers that were basically looked at as, and eh, we'll let those slide because of the cold weather. Mm -hmm. so, so now we're... It hasn't felt like spring here, but I guess technically we're into spring. The worst of the winter weather is over. Back to adding jobs. Yes. Good news? Yeah, good news. And some people would think, well, is the economy slowing? Are we starting to stall? This would suggest maybe not. We're still growing here. It's not, everyone's looking at the progress we've made and saying, it's got to end sometime. We got to slip backwards sometime. It doesn't look like it's happening yet. But all, all of the progress we made, we, we certainly have made progress in recovery but we're closing in on seven years since the beginning of the recession. And we're still not at the peak employment prior to the recession, at the beginning of the recession. We're still not there. Mm -hmm. We're still, if, if my, numbers, my numbers were right from the, uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 400,000 jobs still shy of prior peak employment. This is literally, a, people talk about it as a generational recession. It, in, this, in this matter in particular, it is. The numbers that the the employment numbers that the Bureau of Labor Statistics lets you download on their website go, go back to 1939, mm -hmm. and if you look at all of the recessions between now going back to 1939, typically you're seeing employment recover to pre-recession peak employment in the course of a couple of years, maybe yeah. three years is is a long one. Now we're looking at seven years where we we've been out of this recession or since this recession started, still not back at peak employment. We were just talking about winter, uh, about how difficult of winter is here. One thing that, that I always find funny, and this is, this is the human mind at work, is that when you have a tough winter, or maybe it's just any winter, I get to the point where I can't imagine being too warm. Cold all the time. Yep. You go outside, you're cold. You're always bundled up. And then, you can't imagine what it's like to, for it to be so hot outside that you're like, I have to get inside to where it's cold. Right. And then all of a sudden summer's here, and of course that happens, and you've got the air conditioning on out, inside, and you go outside and you're like, oh, it's so hot out here, I can't imagine not be. Is this an analogy or are you just complaining about the winter? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of both. I think that that may describe some of what we're, uh, as a, maybe the entire world, not just the U.S., going through in the wake of this recession. It's everything has been so lackluster. We're, we're taking so long to recover these jobs. It was such a deep recession that everybody has gotten into this mindset that we literally can't even imagine what it's like to be in a really good, strong economy. Yeah. All, all, we, can, all we can picture anymore is this winter, is this winter of being like, ah, oh, 
you know, jobs are just creeping along. Uh, businesses aren't really spending all that much. They're hoarding cash, they're keeping cash on their balance sheets. It'll be really interesting to see what happens once that mindset, and it will, just like summer coming around, at some point that mindset will reverse. It'll be really interesting to see what happens when it does. Yes. Also dangerous. <laughs> How so dangerous? Dangerous because when you get into that summer where you know, jobs are being created out of thin air, companies are spending cash left and right, M &A, big M&A deals are happening. Isn't that already happening though? No, no, no not, not like the transformational M&A deals that you see at, at, at peaks of markets. Once you start getting that, and, and right now still 50%, 50 of people, according to some surveys, still think it's a bad idea to invest in the stock market. So once you get to where more than half of, more than half of people, maybe two thirds of people are saying, oh, the stock market's a great place to put my money, that's when you gotta start worrying. Not that's yet. when people forget what it's like, like to worry. To Don't be make in me winter. worry. Well, it's not yet. Not yet. Second headline. Second headline, talking about worrying. Bank of America in settlement talks over credit card practices. This is a potential settlement with the CFPB? Yes. Credit card, and what is it, $800 million there, or at least $800 million, so not a monumental settlement, especially for Bank of America. This is nothing for them. Jump, jump change. Um, I've said it before, I think it says more about the CFPB and how they are not some just phantom agency that doesn't do anything. They seem to be doing stuff, and this isn't a concern for Bank of America. I would say this is more of a concern for the small payday type lenders that the CFPB has really been targeting. So if they're gonna go after Bank of America, they've started to look at small payday lenders. I think you should be somewhat concerned if you have an investment in one of these lenders, um, in a company that relies on one of these lenders. One of the examples is Prospect Capital, the BDC. One of their biggest holdings is in First Tower, a lender that has high interest rates, kind of a payday type lender. You gotta start to wonder, is this gonna impact the industry? It could, it could. I mean, it depends on, a lot of it depends on how things are disclosed and how they conduct themselves. High interest rates alone don't make a bad right. lender. Uh, in this particular case, I, I think it's just worth pointing out that this isn't just Bank of America. So this was a case of add-on services to their credit cards, um, particularly payment, payment protection, that, those sort of services. And Capital One's been hit with this. Uh, JP Morgan's been hit with this. There are a few other banks that have been hit with this already. So this is more like Bank of America jo joining the crowd. The party. I, mean, I guess as, as moms everywhere have said, if everybody else is jumping off a bridge, do you do it too? I guess in this case, Bank of America did, mm -hmm. both in terms of doing the wrong thing and, and getting hit. Uh, since I already took the time to, to do, do my whole warm cold analogy, I'll go ahead and pull that in here too. I think it's very similar with Bank of America too. Bank of America has been in the dumps, has been on the wrong side of investor sentiment for so long, um, has been on the wrong side of, of legal struggles for so long that I think for investors it's hard to imagine the day when things are actually going right, consistently going right mm -hmm. for Bank of America. Again, it will be interesting to see if the bank can turn that around and what that'll look like. Right. Third and final headline. We're going to some earnings expectations. Wall Street Journal, U.S. banks expected to post weaker earnings. Uh, Subheadline: trading revenue, mortgage lending slump. Sounds just like last quarter. I know, deja vu. Then, see, that's the thing about quarterly earnings, is that when Not you go from, changes. yeah, when you go from one quarter to the next, particularly when you're talking about established companies, particularly when you're talking about companies in our industry, in the financial industry, I think if you get outside of this, go to some growth, uh, growth industries, uh, companies that are in development stages, that are, that are rapidly expanding and changing, it's a little bit different. But for a lot of what we cover, not a whole lot changes. Um, I, I don't expect earnings to, to surprise anybody too much to the upside. We've seen the Fed start to taper, or continue its taper, I guess I should say. But despite the expectation that that'll bring rates up, that that would help, rates are actually down. On the long end of the yep. yield curve, so we've actually seen a little bit of a flattening of the yield curve so far in 2014. And that's not the ideal situation for banks. We'd actually like to see that steepen for banks to do better. So that's not a great thing. Um, we've still got legal settlements coming in here. That'll take a bite out of earnings. Especially Bank of America this quarter. Uh, the settlement with the FHFA will take a big hit to this quarterly earnings. So that'll be in there as well. 
Yep, yep. So, but that, yeah, you're you're not going to see huge revenue growth mm -hmm. until we get a better interest rate environment for the banks because the non-interest income part of the the balance or the income statement there, it's not going to go crazy. We, mortgage banking down, trading down, investment banking fees have been up, but as we pointed out in a couple earlier shows, it's not a huge portion of the business right. for these banks here. So the biggest component is going to be interest income, makes up around half of the revenue at the big banks like Bank of America and JP Morgan. So that's really going to be the big lever. You're really going to see revenue move when interest rates move, and that just hasn't happened yet. Agreed. All right. Focus for today. Next week, I actually leave for Las Vegas today. I'm going to be meeting up in Las Vegas with full writer and guest on the show, guest host on the show, Patrick Morris. Mm -hmm. We're going to be at the Transact 2014 conference. Or so you tell us that's what you're going to do. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are doing out there. I can, I can bet the ponies in my downtime and yeah. still go to the Transact conference. So be at Transact 2014. This is a, a payments and payment technology conference, which I think is, is, is very, very exciting. When we're, when we're talking about this industry and how quarter to quarter um, things aren't changing all that much. I think one area where we are seeing a good amount of change, and maybe it's not really a quarter to quarter thing, but in payments, in, in the way uh, people are paying, paying for things, uh, people are using credit cards or not using credit cards, the types of um, payment technologies uh, we have coming into the market. Mobile payments increasing, mobile users increasing. Right. Um, I, you know, you look at companies like Bank of the Internet that are, I wouldn't say they're, they're pioneering online banking by any means, but they're kind of taking that extreme model and, and really making a good go of it uh, right now. But we look at companies like PayPal, still part of eBay. Uh, PayPal doing a lot of things in, in payments, a lot of really interesting things, partnering now uh, with, credit, with credit card companies there. Um, so PayPal, We'll be at the Transact Conference. We'll see Google at the Transact Conference. Google has a, a payments division. Um, I, I think Google is one of the companies that's sort of overlooked in, in, that, in, in that industry, mm -hmm. in that kind of sub-industry. Um, given the, the penetration that they have with email, with Gmail users, um, with uh, Google Plus, not really that much, but but I mean they, they touch a lot of customers out there, and I think being able to offer a payment solution to those customers. I mean, right now you can you can uh, open up an email, a new email in Gmail, and attach money to it, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know that a lot of people know you can do that, but as Google gets that word out, develop its develops its capabilities. Uh, Visa and Mastercard uh, will both uh, be at this conference. So a couple of uh, or a few of the uh, a few of the sessions that, that Patrick and I are going to be going to, um, one of them is winning through mobile. We were just talking about this. Mobile has become such an important component of banking and then obviously also of, of payments uh, specifically. Um, and it's going to be important for the companies involved in payment technology to know, to, to not just have mobile. I mean, it's not enough to just have mobile. You have to know how to do it right. Yeah. So we're hoping to get some good information there. Future of money, again, talking about Bitcoin, talking about how people are going to transact uh, down the road. Uh, probably some interesting stuff there. Security and mobile payments. We had that big target uh, credit breach, which I actually got hit with. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a consistent target shopper. Um, I only, my family only has one credit card. We have a Capital One credit card. Capital One just said, you were shopping at Target with this card during that period. We're just going to cancel that credit card. You still got your stuff though, right? My what stuff? Your goods and services, right? <laughs> Come and repossess my, my. You never know what they do. My almond milk. We're taking taking this back. Wasn't that part of the thing? And never mind. Keep going. <laughs> but it, it wasn't just Target. It was also it was also Michaels and was it Neiman Marcus as well? Was that the other one? I think so. I don't want to call out the wrong. But but anyway, security is really important here, and uh, there there are a lot of there are a lot of different technologies and potential solutions, but it's a question of how do you get the entire industry on board to, to implement one of these? Uh, because it's, it's not going to be easy and it's, uh, it's not going to be without cost. Right. Um, we've got, we've got a, a panel here specifically on Bitcoin, Bitcoin threat or opportunity for the payments industry. That's pretty straightforward and, and I think that'll be um, 
even even in light of everything that's happened with Bitcoin, I think it's still interesting uh, to think about the future of that. And, and you mentioned all the, the big companies out there, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, Google. Uh, I, I start to wonder if these companies that are in such great financial position, a lot of cash on their balance sheet, if the new model is going to follow a little bit of the Facebook model and just buying up every kind of threat or opportunity there is in the marketplace. You look at PayPal, they bought Braintree, I think was the parent company of the name. Uh, they controlled the Venmo app, mm -hmm. which everyone was using on their phone, starting to gain popularity. PayPal came in and just scooped it up. So I wonder if that's going to be kind of the new model with mobile payments because it can move so fast and things can pick up uh, or kind of catch on so quickly. Mm -hmm. These big companies will just be like, well, let's just go buy that. Just pick that's, off everybody. That's, that's nothing to us in the scheme of these big companies with so much cash. So basically, if you're an entrepreneur right now, go ahead and start up a payments company because that's the that's the new way to, to strike it right. I would think so. I mean, you look at, look, look at Square and they didn't get bought out or, or sell out to anybody and they're looking to go public now and that's going to be a multi-billion dollar valuation now. Whereas if someone would have scooped them up when they started and had the idea, yep. uh, that would be a lot more Not Not that these, not that these big uh, internet social media companies in particular seem to have any aversion to spending a few billion dollars right. or many billions of dollars here and there. So, so Patrick and I will be there, we'll be on the floor at the exhibition hall, we'll be in some of the sessions, and we're also gonna have some uh, interviews, some one-on-one -on -one interviews that we'll be doing. Uh, we'll probably, the two of us, me and Patrick, will be hosting uh, sort of live from Las Vegas, not really live, but live-ish from Las Vegas, where the money is, mm -hmm. so look forward to that, and, uh, and hopefully be coming back next week with a, with a head full of payments data. Sweet. Uh, we have an email address. That email address is WTMI at fool.com. We've got a question today. We love getting questions. Uh, we've got a question from Amar. Amar asks, I'm trying to compare all of the baby Berkshires to Berkshire itself. You know, like Mar Markel, Allegheny, Lucadia, and others. What will have the best growth with rising rates? What has the best growth from acquisitions and investment? It's a good question here, an interesting question here. So, Berkshire Hathaway, the mo surprisingly not a not not a model that's that's followed all that often, given how successful it is. But uh, definitely been a model for Markel. Uh, probably been a model over at Lucadia. Um, not not quite a one for one there. Um, and then Allegheny, I, I think solid and sure. Borderline whether I'd call that a baby Berkshire or not. But um, in terms of so, I'll, I'll hit the first one in terms of uh, who's going to benefit the most from rising interest rates, I think you got to look to Markel and Allegheny uh, of that group probably benefiting the most mm -hmm. because they both have uh, the, um, the, the large portfolios of fixed income securities. Right. When we think about Markel, we think about Tom Gaynor and how well he's done investing in equities. And that's true. I expect that to continue to happen. But this is still an insurer. They still have to keep uh, ready liquid, relatively liquid assets, stable assets mm -hmm. that they can pay out claims because that's first and foremost for an insurer. So that's all, that's a big, big fixed income portfolio. When we think about rising rates, probably take a hit uh, on the front end yeah. as, as rates rise from the, from the securities that they hold. Um, but longer term, bigger picture, I think both of those benefit a little bit more than Lucadia, which isn't an insurer. Right. And in terms of which one's going to have the biggest impact to an acquisition side, I think it would probably be Lucadia just because the size of of Berkshire itself, I mean, we can have sizable acquisitions there, but in terms of really moving the needle and fundamentally changing the business, mm -hmm. probably not going to have an acquisition that does that to Berkshire. Markel, they just had a really big acquisition with Altera in, I guess it's now two years ago, right? 2012. Yeah, I keep wow. saying last year, so now it's only 2012. Um, I don't, they have Markel Ventures where they go out and buy smaller companies, but again, that's not going to move the needles. Lucadia, they have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. They have no trouble going out and buying businesses that you would say, they bought what? Yeah. I mean, this is a company that has a huge investment bank in Jefferies. They have a beef processing. Well, and that was a huge recent, relatively recent acquisition. Right. Uh, and they have car dealerships. I mean, they're just, they look for the opportunity and don't really care which industry it is. They will look for the right price and will use the cash on the balance sheet to do that. So in terms of an acquisition uh, maker. Mm -hmm. It would probably be Lucadia. Yeah, I, growth there. I, I'm definitely on board with you there. Uh, Lucadia is uh, 
growth is more along, along the lines of using the acquisitions. I think with Markel, we think about the acquisitions a lot. Altera, I mean, Altera was a big acquisition, but that was really an acquisition to augment its yeah. insurance business, as opposed to the sort of Berkshire type acquisitions where it's building this conglomerate through acquisitions. Uh, so for Markel, uh, the Markel Ventures is, is neat because it makes it look a lot more like, like a true Berkshire, um, but it's still so very small. small still gaining steam. If we think out 10 years, 20 years, I think Markel Ventures could end up playing a, a very big role mm -hmm. in what Markel is, but not right now. And that's the thing that we have to remember. I mean, the leadership at Markel, we always talk about Tom Gaynor, he's in his 50s. Warren Buffett's in his 80s. So, right. I mean, that's it's been a very long time for Berkshire and how much it's changed over the last 30 years. So, I'm not saying it's going to be Berkshire. Hey, baby Buffett. But Baby Berkshire, baby Buffett. Just saying, he's young. All right. Do we have a Do we have a game for today? Nope. No game for today. It is Friday. It's a straight game. serious Friday. Serious Friday. We had we had the April no Fools. Around. No horsing around. April Fools joke earlier this week. Speaking of, if if any listeners didn't listen to that one, that's one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. It's a good one. That was April one. Uh, so finishing off on the Twitter sphere, what's the first tweet? First tweet. It's from Jason Moser at TMF JMO. Not sure about Grubhub the stock yet but I'm sure that it's key metric daily average grubs is now my favorite key metric ever. Daily average grubs, and we just talked about earlier. We this just week, talked about this. Some ridiculous metrics. Why are they not listening to us on this show? What would be our ridiculous metric? Um, average mailbags received per day. That's, that would be a good one. Or number of sound effects used per minute of show. Mm. Words spoken per podcast. <laughs> Good one. Longest laugh. <laughs> Longest laugh for sure. All right, second tweet. Second and final tweet, right? Second and final tweet. This comes from Michael Gilpatrick. Uh, that's at mgilpat629. Tweets at us, at TMF Financials. Animal I would like to see domesticated. The sloth. And then hashtag way behind on my podcasts. That is, it's a little, little, little late, little behind, but no problem because I love that answer. A domesticated sloth would be very, very cool. Can a sloth like walk around though? Sloth can do whatever it wants. I thought it only can like Hang crawl down. on its back. You're gonna have to have like things around your house for it to move. Well, wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that make it even more awesome? What was ours? A, a tiger or a bear? I don't remember. I think you you might have said tiger. I'd have to I'd have to go back. It's been a while. I'd like to revise. I don't. I may have said this, but I would revise my answer to an otter today. An otter? Yeah. You want a domesticated otter? Yeah, those things are awesome. Okay. I'd have to think about it again. There's so many animals that would be awesome. Ostrich? Pretty cool. I don't know about that. Big omelets. Where are you going to put that? You'd get it for the omelets? Big omelets, yeah. <laughs> You're a weird dude. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, that's our show for today. Uh, you can find us on iTunes uh, while you're there. Why not give us a rating? You love the show, of course. Let everybody else know why you love it. You can find us on Twitter as well, at TMF Financials. I'm Matt Copenheffer. Right here is David Big Omelet Hansen. <laughs> That's our show for today. That's our show for the week. We'll see you next week. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.